On March 2, 1998, 19-year-old college student Suzanne Lyle left work at the Crossgate Mall in Gilderland, New York, around 9.20 p.m. She took a bus back to campus and was seen exiting the bus near her dorm. However, she never made it back to her room. The next day, Suzanne's bank card was used at an ATM in a local convenience store. But Suzanne was never seen again. Welcome to the Fact and Suspicion podcast. Tonight, we will be discussing the disappearance of Suzanne Lyle. So... Ben, I should probably just go ahead and tell everybody the reason that I got so interested in Suzanne Lyle to start with is because this is one of those cases where Israel Keys is brought up a lot. I mean, that's just about half our cases at this point, right? It really is. I I remember we mentioned it with Lauren Spear, and I I think we omitted it from Jennifer Kessie because it wasn't a very good connection. Right. people, People bring it up with Jennifer Kessie. You know, I've even heard Israel Keys brought up with Mara Murray before. I haven't heard but, that, but it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, I, I don't think, I mean, you have to kind of dig deep into Mara Murray to get that, but if you're reading about Israel Keys, you're more likely to hear about it, right? Understandable, yeah. But, um, you know, of all those just random cases where they say, well, it could be Israel Keys, I, I think this may be one of the more likely ones to actually have him involved. Was she on the list? Yeah, she she actually was was on the list. Um, so if, if any of the listeners don't know, uh, Israel Keys was interested in a lot of missing persons cases, and he would um, he would search these names on his computer a lot to you know keep up with them and, and see what was going on with the investigations. And uh, when he was caught, you know the FBI took his computer and they went through a search history and compiled a list of these names that he was researching. Uh, so some of the, the people on the list were his victims for sure. And some of the people on the list we know were not his victims. So it seems like he was just interested in them. But Suzanne Lyle was one of these names. So just because uh, he was researching them doesn't mean he actually killed them? No, definitely not. I think there were 40 names, 44 names, something like that on the list. Okay. And and Keyes is believed only to have killed 11. But, you know, they're not sure about that. Now, there's obviously other evidence that he could have been involved in the Suzanne Lyle disappearance. I'm definitely not saying that he did it. I'm not even saying that he's the most likely suspect. I'm just saying that's why I got interested in it to start with, right? But there's a lot of intriguing information in this particular case and a lot of really weird behavior by some people that were involved in it. So, you know, there's a lot to get into with this. And um, I'd like to, you know, get off of Israel Keys for a minute and start talking about Susie a little bit. Suzanne Lyle was born April 6th, 1978. She was thought to be exceptionally bright from a young age, especially when she was dealing with computers. She was, uh, she was a bit of a computer nerd, and she also loved writing poetry. She was very passionate about the things she loved, though Susie was also sort of a quiet person. She had a small group of friends, and she sort of kept to herself a lot as well. Now, after high school, Susie went to the State University of New York at Aniana to study computer science. And I'm just going to call that SUNY Aniana from now on. But uh, Aniana was about an hour and a half from her hometown of Boston Spa. Now, after a year at Aniana, Susie transferred to SUNY Albany, which was only about a half hour from her hometown. Now, Susie told her parents that the reason she wanted to leave Aniana was because she didn't feel like their computer program was very good. And she actually told her parents that she felt like she could teach those classes she was taking. But her parents really felt like she wanted to move closer to home to be closer to her boyfriend, Rich Condon. Now, apparently her relationship with Rich had been strained while she was at Aniana. So coming back to Albany, um, you know, they think maybe that was her idea to patch that back up and, and get 
get things back to a, a better state with that, right? Makes sense. Now, Susie and Rich had had trouble in their relationship even before uh, her moving to Aniana. And uh, her parents said that Rich was often, you know, sort of controlling of Susie. Was he abusive at all? Uh, no, we, we've had no reports of him being abusive towards Susie. But, you know, she tried to break up with him a few times. And they sort of felt like Rich had manipulated her into staying with him. They said Susie would break up with him, and then a few hours later, Rich would call the house and talk to Susie for a few hours and beg her to come back, and she would. Now, Susie was also very close to her parents, Mary and Doug. They said she checked in with them almost every day, whether she called home or maybe dropped an email or something like that, just you know, letting them know what she's doing, let them know she's, she's okay, right? Now, it was a big shock to Mary and Doug when on the morning of March 3rd, Rich called them and asked if they knew that Susie was missing. Now, to start with, that seems really strange that he would call and say, did you know Susie's missing? Instead of calling and saying, hey, have you heard from Susie? I haven't talked to her. Right. That, that is bizarre. I mean, it seems like the first call you would make would be to the family to see if she was there. You wouldn't just say, yeah, hey, no. she's missing. Yeah, Exactly. But, uh, but Rich explained to them that every night when Susie got in from work, she would call him. And the, the night before, she had not called him when she got in from work. So Rich had tried to call her in her dorm room pretty much all night long and could not get a hold of her. So that next morning uh, is when he called her family to tell, tell them that she was missing. Susie's parents immediately contacted campus police. Campus police went out to her dorm room and they looked around and nothing was out of place. And they just felt like there wasn't anything to really be alarmed about. Um, you know, they said to Susie's parents that it's, it's not uncommon for a college student to stay out all night and not contact her family. And, you know, Susie's parents knew this was really uncharacteristic of her not to, to check in with someone. She wasn't a partier, right? She didn't stay out all night. That wasn't the kind of person she was. So Susie's dad actually drove to campus to start looking for Susie and hopefully to make sure the campus police are still, are still looking for her. And Susie's mom uh, stays home by the phone, hoping she'll hear from Susie. Now campus police went to Susie's next class that morning to see if she'd show up there. And she did not. And that panicked uh, her family even more because Susie definitely didn't miss classes. At this point, even though state police haven't been called in yet, Mary is trying to figure out what she can do to try to find Susie. She has the idea to call Susie's bank and check to see if her bank card has been used recently for any withdrawals. And had it? Well, the lady from the bank told Mary that Susie's card had been used twice the day before. That was the second. It had been used once earlier in the day to withdraw $20, and that was at an ATM on campus. And then again, later in the day, at an ATM at the Crossgate Mall where she worked to withdraw another $20. Now, according to Susie's mom, uh, Susie often withdrew $20 at a time. That was pretty normal for her. Maybe she needed to get some food or something like that. So nothing However, out of the ordinary. The, just, yeah, nothing just, yeah. out of the ordinary with that, yeah. However, she did think it was kind of strange that she made two withdrawals in one day. She felt like Susie probably wouldn't do that because she didn't think she'd want to pay two different withdrawal fees. But that's, that's not that strange, right? Yeah, of course. However, while they're on the phone, another transaction comes through. Was it another $20 withdrawal? Uh, it was a $20 withdrawal, but the lady at the bank cannot tell Mary where it was made just yet. Apparently, with the technology of that day, they wouldn't know the location of that withdrawal until the next day when uh, all of the transactions compiled, I suppose. So just when it was no longer of use, basically? Pretty much, yeah, because, you know, Mary was ready to go to the location right then and try to find Susie, but right, yeah. you know, obviously it didn't happen. Yeah, that's, that's disappointing. So another day goes by, and there's still no trace of Susie. So the campus police finally call in the state police and the state police are able to start investigating. 
and they can start to put together what Susie did uh, right before her disappearance. So on the second, Susie went to work at the Babbage's store at the Crossgates Mall. And Babbage's is something like a GameStop. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it. I don't. Did they not have them in this area? I don't think so. I think it was regional. And I, I think GameStop actually bought them out like they bought out everything else. Gotcha. But Susie's manager said that, you know, in the days before this, she had been really stressed about midterms. But on the second, she had just taken an exam that morning. And she seemed to be in a much better mood about that stuff that day. So she she was having a good day. It seems about normal for a college student. Right. Um, so she left that mall uh, about 9.20 p.m. And she got on a public bus. She took that bus back to campus. And we do have a witness that saw her get off that bus around 9.45 p.m. So she did make it back to campus then. We're pretty sure that she did. Um, the thing about this is, and this is something that uh, the investigator, his name is Jim Horton. Uh, he was an investigator with the state police. And I heard an interview he did on the Upstate Unsolved podcast. And he was saying that by the time the state police got called in, by the time they found these witnesses, it had been, you know, two, two and a half days since this happened. Gotcha. And she rode the bus every day, right? Right. So if these people are used to seeing Susie get on and get off that bus, yeah. they may not remember what day it actually happened. Yeah, that makes sense. So we're pretty sure that she got back to campus about 9.45 p.m. But it's not hard to believe they could have just been remembering a, a different day. Yeah, that's that's very true. Um, and that the place she got off the bus is about a three-minute walk back to her dorm building. Were there multiple witnesses who saw her or just the one? We have the bus driver. He drove her every time she rode that bus, right? Right. And then um, a lady saw her get off the bus while she was getting on. And that particular lady uh, actually lived in the same dorm building as Susie. They weren't friends, but they were sort of acquaintances in passing. So, so she, knew, she, she definitely knew what Susie looked like then and who she was. Yes, yeah, she would have definitely been able to identify Susie. Gotcha. So if they're correct, she had to have disappeared sometime between getting off the bus and her apartment or dorm, right? Yeah, and, and as I said, that's only a three-minute walk. And her uh, her suite mates said that she never showed up that night. Apparently, Susie had this keychain that was just full of keys, and every time she'd unlock the front door, it would make this terrible racket, and they all hear it. So, do we know if she usually went straight back to her dorm after getting off the bus, or did she, I mean, did she tend to go anywhere else first? Uh, yeah, actually, she usually did go back to her dorm room. However, sometimes Rich or Rich's family would pick her up in a visitor's parking lot just a couple minutes from that bus stop. However, that's in the other direction from her dorm room. Now, according to Rich, they didn't pick her up that night because she had class again the next morning, but they did often pick her up and drive her back to, to their home. Okay, so that was just when she was staying with them. Right. Other than that, she, she pretty much almost always went back to her dorm room when she got off the bus. Uh, yeah, I got you. Now, her, um, her suite mates said that her phone did ring all night long. So Rich's story about the fact that he kept calling her all night, uh, that seems to hold water. And it is important to note that they didn't think anything about Susie not coming in because they didn't really talk to Susie that much. As I said before, she sort of kept to herself a lot and Susie didn't tell them that she wasn't coming in that night, but they wouldn't have expected her to tell them that. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So they didn't think anything was amiss, but th they did hear the phone ringing. Gotcha. Now, the next day, the state police are able to get those records from the bank about the ATM withdrawal, right? All right. Do they and have the location they, now? They have the location. It's a convenience store called Stewart's, just a few minutes from campus. Is that where she usually got the withdrawals from? No, no. Um, I'm not saying that she never used that before, but she didn't habitually use that store. Okay. And they also found out that her PIN number was entered correctly on the first try. So it definitely seems to have been her then, right? 
Well, not necessarily. Um, I mean, I guess it, it could have been Duress, right? Right. Um, it, it's been known for, you know, killers to force a pin number from a victim. And also, we should note that Rich actually told police that only he and Susie knew the pin number. It seems like, though, if it had been someone else, that they probably would have at least tried for more money first. Um, Maybe. Maybe so. Well, that, that sort of ties into the Israel Keys thing, and I'll, I'll get into that later if we talk about him some more. Okay. But um, I do want to talk about what happened here at, at the convenience store. So immediately, police go to see if there's a camera on that ATM. And this ATM does not have a camera, sadly. That's a shame. There is a security camera in the convenience store, but you can't see that ATM from the camera. It only really focuses on the cashier in the front counter there. So no luck there either, then? Not really. Now, police pull security footage from that camera uh, for most of the day, and they start going through those ATM transactions, and they're matching up um, people they see go to the counter after a transaction. Uh, They're contacting people that made ATM transactions there. They're ruling out everyone they see on the camera. And there is only one person they can't rule out and they can't identify the person. And he was uh, making a purchase just after the time that Susie's ATM card was used. This was a black man in a Nike hat. And they have a, a composite drawing done of him. And they put it out, and this guy becomes known as Nike Man. And they're trying to find Nike Man. But they were never able to find him? Um, Not immediately. It it takes quite a while for them to find Nike Man. They do eventually find him. Oh, okay. As a matter of fact, uh, Rich's mother, Donna Condon, starts to rent billboards all around Albany. And she puts Nike Man's picture on the billboard and puts the number to contact if you know this man, please contact us so the police can question him, right? Okay. Which is is admittedly kind of strange. A little bit. Um, I mean, particularly for someone that I mean, that they have so little evidence of his involvement, you know? Yeah, I mean, He was really. in the store and wearing a cap. I mean, that, that's it. Yeah, that, well, well, I mean, they, they were able to sort of draw a picture of him, so and they knew he was there around the time of that transaction, right? I mean, I would get it if you know, if there had been a camera on the on the ATM and he'd been standing suspiciously behind her, right? Like that right, might make yeah. sense, but just buying some items from the store, I mean, it, mm, seems a bit much. It's really strange, but the billboards apparently work because they're able to find Nike Man eventually. Does he turn himself? Well, I say turn himself in. Does he? Uh, does he come forward himself, or did someone else uh, point him out? Um, you know, I've actually heard different reports on this. Uh, some reports say they were called in by tips and other reports say that he, he came in on his own, but, um, all the reports agree that he did come in willingly to talk to police and they interviewed him multiple times and he was eventually cleared. They never actually released his name, but this man was a convicted rapist Oh, and he He also worked on the campus of SUNY Albany. No wonder they interviewed him multiple times then. Yeah, yeah, but but for some reason they cleared him. Now, I don't know for sure why they cleared him. Mary Lyle did say that when he paid for his cup of coffee and lottery ticket that he bought, he used um, like a wad of ones, which doesn't seem consistent with him having just gotten a 20 from the ATM. right? Right, yeah. But but he was he was cleared. Now, a lot of of uh, sort of blogs I've read about this and some YouTube videos. They say that Nike Man actually used her card, which is is not true. There's no proof of that. Where did they um, get that's that? Just some, I don't know where they're getting that. I think it's just maybe, you know, unclear news reporting. Maybe they've read. But that, that's not the case. There's no evidence that he ever had her card or used her card. Okay. Um, no, no evidence that he was involved whatsoever, actually. I mean, if he had so her I, card, that'd be pretty damning. That would. But, but uh, as I said, there's, there's no evidence of that at all. And police did clear him. So I just want to clear that up for anyone that's, that's read that somewhere. All uh-huh. right. Now, one more strange thing about Nike Man, though, is that uh, investigator Jim Horton, well, in his interview, 
he said that even after Nike Man came in and was cleared, that Donna kept these billboards up. And he actually, um, you know, had to call the billboard company and request that they they stop with, you know, these billboards because the state police keep getting calls about it. <laughs> right. They're having they're having to look at all these, you know, tips they get, even though they know they're pretty much useless. Yeah. It's causing them a lot of extra work. But even though he asked Donna to take them down, she didn't take them down for some strange reason. Bit overzealous there, I'd say. Yeah. I mean, I don't understand just... why she would be given the circumstances, but Yeah. It was there's a lot of crazy stuff with Rich's family. We'll we'll get on into it in a minute, but um but there's there's one other thing um I would like to cover about this uh before we get into the suspects. Because there really um there wasn't much more evidence that was ever found except in May. Now, Susie goes missing at the beginning of March, right? Right. Well, in May, Susie's work ID is found in the visitor's parking lot uh, on SUNY Albany campus. And that would be the same parking lot that was, you know, close to that bus stop and the one she'd walk to when Rich's family picked her up. I mean, do police think that it had been there all along or do they suspect that it was maybe dropped there later? Well, you know... There's no way to really know. There's definitely a possibility that it was, you know, maybe planted there later. But there is a working theory by police that, well, you know, she went missing in March in New York, right? So there's snow. Yeah, gotcha. And they think that maybe it was dropped just in the snow in the parking lot and maybe a snow plow pushed it to the side and covered it up. So it wasn't actually found until all that thawed out. I guess that's possible. That's it's possible. I mean, it doesn't and strike it, me it, as particularly plausible, but I mean, I, I suppose it's possible. It's possible. And um, another uh, piece of information about that is that Susie's manager said that was actually her old work ID. They weren't using that same type of ID card at the time. So, you know, I guess it's also possible that she may have just dropped it out of her bag and it had nothing to do with her disappearance. Right. Yeah. I mean, was it along the path that she walked just about every day? Well, I'm not sure that she walked it every day, but as I said, that's the same parking lot where Rich's family said they'd pick her up on the weekends to take them back to their house. So, I mean, she could have dropped it a couple weeks earlier in the snow and it had been pushed to the side too. Yeah, exactly. But um, they did really look into this and, and they never could, you know, there was no, there were no fingerprints or anything on the ID. They couldn't find anything on the ID that gave them any clues about anything. There are also some strange coincidences in Susie's disappearance with a lady named Karen Wilson that vanished 13 years earlier in March of 1985, the same month, 13 years earlier, right? Okay. Karen lived in the same dorm building that Susie lived in actually. And she went to a tanning bed appointment one evening she left about 7 30 and she never made it to her appointment uh now investigators looked into this but they decided it was just a crazy coincidence and they weren't connected would they have disappeared around the same time um probably not because as i said uh karen left about 7 30 p.m and she never made it to her appointment but Susie, um you know she left work at 9 20 so that would be a little bit later oh, okay but, you know, it is a crazy coincidence that they, they possibly went missing right outside the same dorm building in the same month, right? I mean, it's definitely something you got to look into, at least. Yeah, but they, they did look into it, and they thought they weren't connected at all. So now I'd like to talk about some of the different suspects in the case. And, obviously, your, your first suspect is always the husband-boyfriend, right? Yeah, and he's already... Uh, done something rather suspicious when he called the parents. Yes, Rich had been acting strange, and it's going to get even stranger with him. So, you know, as I said, they'd been having some rocky times in their relationship. Right. And just after Susie goes missing, Rich told her family that they were engaged. Had they heard anything about that from Susie? No, that completely took them aback. They had no idea. Um, and, and I'm not saying that means anything, but it's, it's really weird. It does right? sound a little suspect. Yeah. Well, also rich, rich lawyered up right after, uh, right after her disappearance. Now 
He lawyered up and he refused to take a polygraph. Um, Not going to follow those, him for that. No, I, 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 I want to mention it, but that's the smartest thing to do. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. You should get a um, lawyer and you shouldn't take a polygraph. Exactly. <laughs> now, he also did seem somewhat uncooperative uh, with police. They they had trouble questioning him. Actually, um, his mother, Donna, would never let him be questioned without her being present, even though he was in his 20s. So, yeah, that's a bit weird. A little overprotective, I suppose, but it's well, understandable, Rich, at least. I mean, maybe. Uh, we're going to get more to that in a minute, but I, I do want to say that Rich had an alibi. Um, was it a good one? Well, I wouldn't say it's great. Um, According to Rich, he was playing computer games with a friend of his online. Now, they weren't actually speaking to each other at the time. However, Rich's friend said he knew he was playing with Rich because of of the way that his character was moving. uh, Was this like an MMO or something? I don't know. It never said uh, which, which game it was. And... I mean, the not a lot of choices for online play at that time, right? No, no. Like, Maybe the only EverQuest thing, or something? No, EverQuest wasn't out yet. Oh, um, okay. EverQuest didn't come out until 99, and this was in March of 98. So I, I looked into it. It could have been Diablo. It could have been Ultima Online. Uh, I, yeah, I, I meant Ultima when I said RuneScape. RuneScape didn't come out until much later, right? I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure when RuneScape came out, but I think it was uh, quite a bit later, yeah. Um. I was thinking and of there, Ultima. I used yeah, to see that was, game at Walmart all the time. I never actually played it though. Played every class, either, but not yet. I knew some people that played Ultima, but yeah, I don't know. But I know, you know, Diablo and Ultima, they're both like, you know, top down games. Mm-hmm. So I don't know exactly how unique someone's moveset could be in those games, right? Yeah. It doesn't really seem like there's a, there's a lot of room for, you know, creative license there, right? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. And I mean I guess what they were trying to, you know, be sure about with his alibi is that it wasn't someone else playing, pretending to be rich, right? Which I don't, that seems a bit elaborate to me, right? I don't know. I'm not saying I doubt rich necessarily, uh, just because he was playing computer games online with someone. If the friend's telling the truth, you know, someone was playing, I don't know. But I can't believe that you can necessarily tell that was rich by the moves he's making i mean this is not later on of, I, I would say definitely like in a first person shooter or something like that yeah absolutely like call of duty 2017 yeah I, I definitely think you could tell who that was as playing but but it might be a little like more that, difficult with like a point and click game like that yeah exactly and you know i thought maybe at the when i thought when i saw this i thought starcraft immediately because you have different strategies yeah i mean that would but, make sense but StarCraft didn't come out until late March of 1998. Okay, so it couldn't have been that. Yeah. And I'd to be like honest, to know what I, game it was. That would. Yeah, I, I do too. I've wanted to know this for a long time, and I can't find it anywhere. He's never said? Uh, you know, if he has, I can't find it anywhere. Uh, I mean, you know, Rich doesn't really talk about it a lot, so. Now, earlier I mentioned um, the investigator Jim Horton with the New York State Police. As I said, he did that interview with the Upstate Unsolved podcast, and if you're interested in this case, I suggest you go check that podcast out because there are several good interviews in their podcast about this, but I I do want to talk about the things that Jim Horton said. He actually was the New York State Police's um, sort of their point person that made contact with Rich's family, the Condons, so he has a lot of information about them. And he has several really strange stories about them. Um, Anything that seems incriminating? Well, one thing seems extremely incriminating, but we'll get into that in just a few minutes. All right. The the very first thing, he tells a story about the first time that he interviewed Mary and Doug Lyle. He said that Rich Condon and his mother Donna were present at the time. And any time he asked Mary and Doug a question, Donna kept answering it for them. Wait, what? And yeah, like like he would ask them a question about Susie, and Donna would step in and answer. She was that. answering for the victim's family. She she was, and he actually said he had to ask her to stop. That's just so that weird. He could, he could get information from the Lyles. Yeah, it's really strange. Donna kept uh, portraying that 
Susie was closer to the Condons than she was to her own family, which was absolutely not true if you listen to Mary and Doug. Also strange. Very, very strange. Um, allegedly, at a, uh, a search that was conducted, Donna Condon made an announcement to everyone after the search leader said, you know, if you find anything, bring it to me. Donna said, no, no, don't bring it to him. Bring it to me because I knew Susie the best and I don't know what to make out of this. The hell? Yeah, this that's is during really an official weird, yeah. search. Um, well, it may have been a privately conducted search. Either but way, still, it's. Uh, I mean, that goes beyond bizarre into something else entirely. Yeah, it's 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 it really is right, and it's so um, it's so strange. I'm not even sure what to make of it. I mean, it could just be a narcissist that wants to be the center of attention. You know, I felt that's very possible. I mean, that would seem to uh, explain a lot of her behavior thus far. Let's let's get on into this just a little bit more here. Okay. So, um, Jim Horton said he would sort of pop in on the Condons from time to time. He he lived close to them, actually. And uh, he said that, you know, uh, Rich's dad, Dick, actually lived in the basement. And then Donna had her own bedroom herself that she lived sort of separately from him. Well, from what I've heard of the woman, I can't say I blame him thus far. So. Right. And then... Um, Rich's grandparents actually uh, lived there in the house as well. They lived in the living room. Now, as I said, Donna said Susie would stay there all the time. So even if they want to, you know, look for evidence in the Condon's house, you know, even if they find some of Susie's, you know, hair or anything like that, it's pretty much useless because she was there all the time, right? You would expect it to be there, right? Yeah. So that was, you couldn't really do anything with that if they were trying to make a search there. Now, Here's another thing that uh, Investigator Horton found super strange. Uh, Donna explained that anytime Susie would stay the night there with them, uh, Susie would sleep in Rich's room, and Rich would go sleep in the bed with his mom. Wait, how old was he? 21, about. Oh, dear dear Lord. Yeah, that's... uh, That is an unhealthy relationship. Yeah, so... It looks like it gets strange. Right? I don't even I don't even know what to I don't even know what to say to that. Yeah. Yep. Now um Horton also said that about a uh a week after Susie's disappearance, he's at the Condon's home and uh there's another girl about Rich's age there already, and they're sitting really close together and stuff. It appeared that Rich already had another girlfriend. Really weird. Did he get any more information about this girl? Um, no, he, uh, he said he really didn't want to press about the girl because he already was having trouble getting information from the Condons. He didn't want to seem Uh, like he was suspecting them. Yeah. He didn't want to seem like he was suspecting them too much because he'd ruined that relationship. Right. And, um, he already, you know, couldn't get much information from him. He said that when he was there, they were very talkative and would talk to him about anything. But when he'd ask questions about Susie, they'd sort of clam up about it and wouldn't have much to say. Which, you know, seems strange, but then again, maybe they're just trying to protect themselves. You know, I'm not sure. But it, it is weird. It seems like, you know, with all the billboards they put up and wanting to help in the searches and stuff, that they don't give a lot of information to the investigators. Yeah. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know exactly what to make of it. They could just be really weird. Possibly. You know, also, remember how I said that Susie spent a lot of time over at the Condon's family on the weekends and stuff? Yeah. Well, apparently in the months leading up to her disappearance, she was spending a lot more time with her own family. So, you know, maybe that shows that things weren't very going very well with her and Rich. But I mean, didn't we know that already, though? We we did know they'd had some rocky times, but this is just sort of another piece of evidence to go along with that. Gotcha. Um, Now, here is the really, really crazy. This is intriguing, but. It's one of the strangest stories I've ever heard in a true crime case. So stranger than a 21 year old man sleeping in the bed with his mother. Yep. Way stranger than that. Okay. All right. So this should be good. As I said, Horton goes over all the time and, you know, talks to these people and he'll, he said he'll have just idle chit chat with them trying to get information. Right. So the summer after Susie disappeared, Horton is talking to Rich's dad, Dick, just having a conversation. And just sort of casually in this conversation, Dick says that he saw Susie 
while he was out driving on his truck route about well, an hour and recently? a half. Yeah. Yeah. He just saw her like, you know, like maybe a week before about an hour and a half west of Albany while he's out driving his truck. And, and this he is the first time he'd mentioned this. Yeah. He didn't call in and report it. You know, and he just thought he, I'll just he just mentioned it casually. Oh yeah, by which, the way, he saw that missing girl. Yeah, that's yeah. that's weird. And this was one of the biggest missing person cases ever in the Albany, New York area. So the fact that he didn't call and report it if he did see her is unbelievable. And uh Horton says, Well, why didn't you stop and go talk to her and tell her what's going on? Everybody's missing her. And uh <laughs> Dick actually told him that he couldn't stop his truck and pull over on the side of the road because he would have gotten a ticket for it. Oh, dear God. Okay, this is straining credulity here. Yeah, and it's going to get a little stranger. Lovely. So, um, Horton tells him, he says, Dick, if you see her again, maybe say something. (laughs) Call me and let me know, you know, immediately. We need to know where she is. So, again, a few weeks later, he goes over and Dick says, hey, I saw her again. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I didn't have a phone with me and uh, I couldn't stop this time because I was uh, trying to turn my truck around or gave some weird excuse, right, that he couldn't stop. And, and, I, and I guess he didn't know anywhere where a phone existed. I, I guess not. So, um, so Jim Horton actually took his state police issued cell phone and he gave it to Dick Condon. (laughs) And he said, Dick, if you see her again, I need you to call me immediately and tell me where she is so we can go find her. Oh dear God. This is just ludicrous, Daniel. Right. So, well then Horton actually gets some undercover investigators to follow Dick Condon. Okay. So he's not, he's not exactly being trusting here. No, no, he, he's because I was he's like, just that, trying that's to get extending him a lot of credit to even yeah. give him the phone. Yeah, so he goes and he's sitting by his desk waiting for a call. He's got these undercovers following Dick, right? So Dick calls him a few days later. He says, uh, you know, he's sitting there in his truck and he sees her sitting on a park bench out in front of him. Now, these investigators were watching him, right? And so Horton. Is has someone contact these investigators say, you know, he's saying that she's sitting on a park bench right there in front of him, explains the scene. And the investigators say, yeah, I see a woman sitting on this park bench, but she's about 80 years old. <laughs> so you know, obviously Dick Condon was lying about this the whole time. I mean, shocking, Daniel. We need to start. Right. But but why keep lying about it? You know? Why even bring it up to start with? I mean, now, the first thing I think of is he's trying to protect his son. This is this is so crazy. I don't even know where. Oh God, I don't even know where to start. Now, I mean, is he trying to protect his son because he knows his son killed Susie? Or I mean, is I he trying? That's possible, yeah. Or he, is he thinks trying to get, that the police you know, suspect his son killed Susie, so he's trying. So to he's trying to get like the heat off of him. I don't know, but it's a really terrible way to go about that because when you're lying to police and you're obviously lying to police they're going to suspect you more right yeah it's ludicrous that's i guess that's the only word that really fits this right yeah yeah i would agree extremely suspicious i mean i know it's so crazy that i don't even know what to do with it i mean yeah it seems a little suspicious but it just it's also just seems insane yeah, and I, you you get the feeling that that this family has like quite a bit of crazy going on, right? Oh yeah. Now, one other thing to note about the Condons is they did own a boat and a car that were both sold shortly after Susie disappeared. That looks strange. That's as well. also, I mean, it doesn't look great. But you know, there's also the fact that Rich seemed very worried about Susie when she first disappeared. And, you know, he did call her parents, like, just first thing in the morning on the next day. Yeah, but he also told them she was missing rather than ask if she was with them. I agree. That's super strange. But, I mean, I will give him credit for calling, you know, first thing in the morning because if, um, let's say he did kill her, he could have given himself some more time before calling it in, right? Yeah. 
I don't know. I'm not sure what to make of, of Rich Condon, but that's, that's really all the information I have on the strangeness of the things going on with his family around this investigation. I mean, his parents acted way more bizarre than he did. No, I agree. And I've often wondered if maybe, you know, his parents saw that they were having trouble, you know, with Susie and, and they wanted to, you know, get rid of Susie so their son could move on or something. I don't, I'm not saying they did, but it's popped into my mind, right? I mean, it's worth considering at least. Uh, but now I think it's time to move away from Rich for a little bit. And let's talk about another couple suspects. And I want to go ahead and talk about Israel Keys now because I, I do think there's some interesting stuff going on about Israel Keys in this case. I mean, well, enough that separates it from the other cases where he's suspected? I'm not going to say it's enough to say, oh, Israel Keys probably did this. But it's definitely enough to set it apart from, you know, Lauren Spear and Jennifer Cassie, right? Gotcha. Okay. Keys was known to be in the area of Albany in March of 98. He had a house in Constable, New York. Now, that's about 200 miles away from Albany. Uh, and he was thought to have been living in that house in 1998. But he was seen in Albany in a Marshall's parking lot in 1998. Uh, somewhere around March. Uh, is what the lady remembered. She didn't remember the exact date. Right. But she had a really strange interaction with Israel Keys in a Marshall's parking lot. I bet that's horrifying to think of in hindsight. Yeah, he. I don't remember exactly what he said to her, but he walks up to the lady, and I think he said, how old are you, or something like that. Like, and, he opened with that? Yeah, he just said something like out of the blue like that to her. And obviously, it really threw this lady off right and then you know he sort of just walked on about his business there after staring at her for a few minutes but she remembered him very well and she actually she calls this in later on after keys is you know captured mm -hmm. which is, is way down the line but she remembered it was you know sometime in in early 1998 and this lady was actually an attorney with the united u.s state department so she's a you know pretty credible witness right yeah and um she actually described him as remembering that he looked like Beaker from the Muppets, <laughs> which that is a pretty strangely, accurate description. Yeah, it's it's a good description of Israel Keys. Um, but you know, she remembered that happening, and then in July of 1998, Israel Keys signed up for the army at a recruitment office in Albany, New York, and that recruitment office is on the same street as the convenience store where Susie's bank card was used in that ATM. Now, that is interesting. Right. And that detail alone sets it apart from some of the other cases we've discussed. Yeah. I mean, usually he thing, just happens to be, or, or it's possible that he might have been in the same state sometime, like, within the last year of the disappearance, and suddenly he's a prime suspect. Right. Well, let's let's also talk about this. Keys did confess to a murder in upstate New York, but that victim was never named. So we know that he said he committed a murder there, but he never said who it was. Now, I want to talk about how, you know, Susie's pen was used to get $20 out of the, out of the bank account. Mm -hmm. Well, Israel Keys actually forced another victim of his to give up her pen number. And he, he then took the card, tested the PIN number by taking out $20 just to be sure it was the right PIN number. And then he went back and killed her. That was actually his last victim or what's thought to be his last victim. She's the one that got him caught. But he, he did that. So that same sort of behavior of someone forcing Susie's PIN number out of her and then going and testing it with a card. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's the same behavior he did with another victim, right? Okay, so about the uh, convenience store. You said that there was a camera that was pointed towards the cash register, but there wasn't actually one on the ATM. My question is, was it possible to enter the store and get to the ATM without being caught by the one camera that there was? Yes, it was possible. Okay, so just because they didn't see anybody on camera that looked like Israel Keys, that wouldn't necessarily mean anything? It doesn't. And Keyes actually admitted to the FBI that anytime he used an ATM, he tried to make sure he was using one without a camera. 
Gotcha. Okay. Now, as we've said, Susie went missing in March of 1998. Israel's first attempt at murder was in 1997. He abducted and raped a young woman, but he let her go. Uh, He just couldn't get the nerve up to murder her at the time, even though he had planned to kill her. He was still working his way up to it at the time then? He, He was. Now, Israel Keyes claimed to the FBI that his first murder was in 2001. But most of the experts that have studied him believe that because he did attempt to murder in 1997 and he was known to lie to the FBI as well and just give them what he wanted them to have, they're pretty sure that he did commit his first murder in 1998. Yeah, it does seem like it would have escalated quicker than that, right? Like, if yeah. his first attempt was in 1997, it's hard to imagine he would have been able to wait until 2001. Yeah, I agree. So that's that's sort of everything we've got that ties Israel Keys to this. But like I said, that's a lot more than you have on any of the other cases. Yeah, definitely. You know, you've got the, the same sort of behavior with the PIN number. You've got the fact that he was known to frequent that Albany area. He um, also probably made his first kill in 1998 when Susie went missing. And she was on the list, which to me is a, you know. Yeah, combined, that's definitely worth looking into him. I mean, was he considered seriously by investigators? Yes, investigators definitely looked into Keys, But again, with Keys, there's almost never any kind of physical evidence, right? Yeah. If people don't know, Keys often uh, would abduct a victim in one state and then go to another state to kill them and then go to a third state to dispose of the body. And he was meticulous about everything. So now this actually fits the, the tri-state area Albany does um, because it's close to all Vermont, New Hampshire and Massachusetts. But if it was his first kill, he may not have been doing that at the time, you know, but was still, his first yeah. kill that, that girl, uh, the barista from uh, Alaska. No, that was his last kill. Oh, was it? Okay. Yes. Um, Samantha, That's the one I've heard the most about. Yeah. I Honestly, I've heard her last name pronounced both Koenig and Koenig. Right, right. But she was the one he forced the PIN number out of her and took her debit card and went and checked to make sure it was the right PIN number. Okay. Gotcha. That, that was her. But, you know, of course, Keyes committed suicide in 2012, and he had never admitted anything about Susie Lyle. So if he was the one... We'll probably never get that information now. Right. Yeah, but I can definitely see why investigators were, you know, thought he might be good for it. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's one other suspect in this case, and this is a man named John Regan. Did he have any sort of relationship with Susie at all? No, he, he didn't have a relationship with Susie uh, that we know of, but um, there are definite reasons to suspect him. Now, let me just tell you a bit about Regan. He was an upstanding businessman in his community. Uh, He lived in Waterbury, Connecticut. I'm detecting some sarcasm there. Well, he was thought to be an upstanding businessman. Okay. Well, that was until 2004. He uh, was arrested for attempting to rape a woman that worked at the roofing company that he managed. Now, was this the first time he'd tried something like this? No, it was the first time he was caught. <laughs> gotcha, okay. See, when they, they arrest him, they take his DNA. And um, Ooh. his DNA matched DNA taken from a woman who was raped back in 93. So he'd been doing this for a while then. Yeah, he had. Now, this lady who was raped in 93, her name was Donna Palumba. And Donna's husband was away on business this particular night. Someone broke into her home and gagged her and blindfolded her and assaulted her. You know, he told her, you better not call the police or I'll come back and kill you, right? After he finally leaves, she gets up and she goes to call the police and he had cut her phone lines. Oh, that's horrifying. Yeah, so Donna, you know, ran to a neighbor's house, called the police. Uh, She went in to the hospital. She did a rape kit and everything. But they never had a suspect. Honestly, the police never took Donna seriously. They thought she was lying and that she was having an affair on her husband. It was just trying to cover it up. 
even though she was, you know, obviously bruised and battered at the time. What was wrong with these people? I don't know. You know, that, especially in the early 90s, that happened all the time with rapes, right? Just, yeah, yeah, I suppose so. The police just didn't take them seriously. But it turns out that Donna's husband was actually a friend of Regan's. Really? So, yeah, Regan knew that his friend was going to be out of town, so he just took the opportunity to go over to his house and rape his wife. So, yeah, yeah he's disgusting. a terrible person, but it gets worse with Regan. Oh, lovely. Yeah, so, um, you know, Regan was arrested for both of these, and then he was released on bail. That sounds uh, ominous. Yeah, yeah, well... Now, just a little bit after he's released on bail, a uh, Walgreens employee contacts the police about some photos that he's developing. Oh, dear God. So uh, he's developing these photos, and they are surveillance-style photos of a bunch of different young women going about their day-to-day -day lives. And he really thought it'd be a good idea to get this developed at a store? Yeah, who knows? This, this guy apparently just thinks he can get away with anything, right? So, um, and this Walgreens employee contacts the police. It turns out it's John Regan's photos. So at this point, the police go ahead and they are preparing stalking charges on Regan and getting ready to pick him up. Now, after Regan was released on bail, he relocated to Saratoga Springs, New York, because obviously he's no longer seen as this pillar of the community that he once was in Waterbury, right? Right. Um, did he think he could just move and that this stuff wouldn't follow him? Well, I guess he knew that the charges would follow him, but at least he could, you know, not be judged by everybody. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what the guy was thinking, but in, uh, in New York, he, um, he attempts to kidnap a high school student. So he, um, he goes on the campus and he parks his van like really close to Lindsay Ferguson's car. And this is okay. while she's a cross-country practice. Now, when Lindsay leaves practice, she goes over to her car and is, is trying to get in. And she's having a little trouble because the van's so close, right? Well, Regan opens up the sliding door of his van and tries to grab Lindsay and pull her in the van. Tell me she gets away. Well, Lindsay is not going down without a fight, right? She right. starts biting, kicking, screaming. And her coach is here screaming. And, uh, you know, remember, these are, she's a cross-country practice. These are cross-country coaches, right? So right. they're over there in a flash, pretty much. You know, one guy gets Lindsay away from the guy. The other guy tries to confront him. Regan just calmly gets in his van and starts to drive off. But one of the guys actually runs after him, calling the police and taking down the license plate number because oh. you know, this is a cross-country guy, right? Good. So, you know, Regan drove bag. off, but the police, you know, they... They pull him over pretty soon. And uh, honestly, the police almost let him go because Regan was such a smooth talker and said, oh, oh no, this was just, this was just a misunderstanding. misunderstanding, you know, nothing. Same thing the guy's done his whole life pretty much, right? Right. Well, as it happens, while one police officer's talking to him, his partner is sort of peeking in the back of his van and uh, they see some stuff that. Well, when they see it, they're not going to let him go, right? Now, I guess we should mention that Regan was doing some handyman work at the time, so uh -huh. that would explain some of the tools that were in the back of his van. Right. But it doesn't explain the tarp that's already spread out across the back of the van. Mm -hmm. It doesn't explain the rope that's already tied into slip knots. Gotcha. He's also got a shovel and a saw in there. I guess that could be explained. Oh, holy Lord. He's got a, a syringe that's filled with a sedative. I mean, what could he possibly say? Oh, there's nothing you can say when, when they find that, right? They also found some more, uh, some more photos in his van. They're pictures of different women, same surveillance-style photos. And some of these photos are actual pictures of Lindsay. I mean, it's sad that it, that it took this. Wait, did you say pictures of Lindsay? Yeah, the, the girl who was trying to kidnap. Trying, they were trying to kidnap, right. Yeah, they're pictures it, it of her, is, so he, it is horrifying that they needed to see this to avoid letting him go. Yeah, it, it really is, right? I mean, at least they, they caught him. So um, he eventually pleads guilty to attempted kidnapping, and he was sentenced to uh, 
Well, he, he pled guilty to that, and he, he had the other charges as well, the the rape, the attempted rape. But and, with, with a syringe with a sedative, what appears to be, I mean, a kill room in the back of his van, they couldn't get him with anything more? You know, I don't know, but no, he he came for money. He had a brother that was a lawyer, so I guess that's why he was able to get out with a lot of the stuff, you know? Yeah, he, maybe He pled so. guilty to it, so he had a plea deal going on, though he would think they could get him for more than that, right? You'd hope so. Well, so he was sentenced to 12 years, 15 years, five years, and two years, all to be served concurrently. Well, in 2017, they go ahead and release him for good behavior. Well, I should, I don't mean, they didn't actually release him. They were going to release him, but the court stepped in and said that even though he's being released, he's still going to have to be held in a psychiatric facility to protect the community, which thank goodness, right? Yeah. Good call on that one. But um, the last I heard, he was still supposed to be going to trials for that. He, he had been to trial a couple times trying to appeal it, but he was still being held. So that, that was the last I could find on it. But uh, let's, let's talk about how Regan ties into Susie Lyle's case. Okay. Uh, Regan was actually questioned about Susie's disappearance and he, um, he refused to talk about it. So there's that. Now, one thing I did not mention earlier about Susie is that she had told a coworker of hers that she was being stalked, but she wasn't worried about it. Did she know the person that she thought was stalking her? She did not say if she knew the person or not, but Regan, you know, obviously is a known stalker. Right. Right. And with the fact that he was, you know, ready to kidnap and kill Lindsay Ferguson, it seems like he had done that before. He had everything planned out. Right. Right. And how far away would he have been from uh, Susie? Well, here's the thing. Back in 98, Regan was working as a traveling salesman who went all over upstate New York and definitely went to Albany quite a bit. I mean, it's hard to believe that he wouldn't have been trolling for victims while he was out. Yeah, I completely agree. So I said he was known to visit the Albany area. Um, We know that he's been committing rapes since 1993. and there's actually another rape reported from 1989 after everything else came out, but the statute of limitations had already passed. So very likely he was raping people in 1989. So, you know, by 1998, he's probably, you know, if he was killing people, he's probably moved on to killing people by then. This man could be a serial killer for all we know. Yeah. I didn't know there was a statute of limitations on rape. Well, there's, I don't think there is any more, but, in the 90s, there was. Gotcha. Right? Or at least in, you know, when it happened, I suppose there was a statute of limitations. Uh, he's suspected in other murders, uh, you know, not officially, but a lot of web sleuths have tried to tie him to some other murders they think he, it's possible he committed. Mm-hmm. But what, based on, like, his travel records or something? Yeah, and just uh, the, um, a lot of the victims uh, were, you know, young women uh, around that same age, you know, bracket. Right that had the similar look to them. Uh, so it seems like he had a type and they, they think that they, he could have been involved in other ones, which, you know, I don't doubt because I mean, look, look what he did to Lindsay Ferguson or tried to do Lindsay Ferguson. Right. Yeah. I mean, it seems like he was trying to kill her. Definitely. And you know, the, the rape of Donna Palumbo was very violent. That, that seemed like he may have been ready to kill her, you know? Yeah. I mean, what's really disturbing about the thing with Lindsay is, like, it didn't seem like he was wearing a mask, was he? He wasn't concerned with her seeing his face. Nope. Which usually only means one thing. Well, I mean, come on. Like, all that stuff in the... He was going to kill her. Yeah, yeah. All that stuff in the in the vehicle. You know, he had a shovel. He had the, the tarp. Everything, man. That yeah. was... I am so glad that she fought and screamed was able to get away, though. Yeah, definitely. That was, and, you know... You know, Regan, he seemed to be smart about this. He had everything planned out. And it's strange that he would pick a, a track athlete, someone that can run right. and could probably get away from him. But, I mean, I, I guess I'm glad he did because he got caught because of it, right? And it seems like he did this in broad daylight, too, right? Yeah, yeah. It was, 
Well, I mean, it was after practice, so even if it was starting at dark, it should have still been light outside somewhat. So yeah, and there were still people around. Yeah, this guy was brazen, and he probably—I mean, I guess he knew he was going to go to jail for a little while because of the rape and everything already. But mm-hmm. I mean, considering he only ended up getting fifteen years for everything. But at any rate, you can see why he was looked at for Susie Lyles. Yeah, of course, right? He was known to have been in the area. He had been raping women for many years. He was definitely a stalker, and he had that kill kit in his car. So he was looked into as well, but never could tie it to him either. But those are are the three suspects I, I see brought up the most. I knew about Israel Keys already, but actually I had no idea about John Regan until I checked out that Upstate Unsolved uh, podcast and I looked into it a bit more, but it was um, it was pretty interesting once I found it. You know, I found the Israel Keys connections to be very intriguing in this one, but if I had to select one of these three suspects, I would have to say it it's most likely to be Rich or his family. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely the ones that acted the most bizarre. I mean, the parents, I, I don't even, I, I don't even know what to say about the, the way they behave. Yeah, but I mean, I guess there is the possibility that they're just sort of crazy. And I suppose if you see your, like, beloved son is a suspect in a murder, you might, even if you guys are innocent, you might do some strange things trying to draw attention away from him, I suppose. That's the only theory I can think of that makes their behavior make even a remote amount of sense. But Honestly, even then, it seems like there would be better ways. You would think so. The thing to me, though, right, like, if they are guilty of something, it seems like lying about seeing Susie is even dumber. Right. Because it's really going to draw attention to you. I mean, the, and, him him claiming to have seen Susie doesn't make sense. In either case, innocent, no. guilty, it doesn't make any sense. No, the only thing I can think of is that, you know, maybe he just wanted some attention to, you know, that's, that's I mean, the that, most that sense seems I can to be the about. issue with them, man. They're just like, they're just attention whores. Maybe they are. Now, I will, I'm there. I would not rule Israel Keys out of this. You know, you could say that evidence is circumstantial, but that's. That's pretty strong circumstantial. I mean, all of the evidence here is circumstantial, so it is no difference. It is, though. You know, when someone is murdered, it's, I mean, it's usually someone that knows them, right? Yeah, in the overwhelming majority of cases. 25% of murders are committed by a stranger, I think. Oh, I'm surprised it's that high, to be honest. It's 20 to 25, I think. Um, But even then, that's not great odds. I mean, you can always say this was a crime of opportunity, but what are the odds of that? Yeah, yeah, I'd have to agree. After Suzanne's disappearance, Mary and Doug Lyle became activists for reform of how missing persons cases on college campuses are handled. On April 6th, 1999, which would have been Susie's 21st birthday, Governor George Pataki signed the Campus Safety Act into law. Also known as Suzanne's Law, it required missing persons on college campuses to be reported immediately to the state. This was also included in the PROTECT Act of 2003 that President George W. Bush signed into law. Doug Lyle died in 2015, never knowing what happened to Susie, though Mary still holds out hope that one day she will find the answers to Susie's disappearance. <laughs> 